my name is Isabel Skidmore. I am the lead nutrition developer at Wolfram Alpha, and I will be presenting on food and nutrition in the Wolfram language. Welcome. I'm Isabel, by the way. I'll be talking today about food and nutrition in the Wolfram language. Um, we've given quite a few talks about food and nutrition in the Wolfram language at previous tech conferences. I think those are available online if you ever want to go look at them. Um, I'm going to go briefly over some of the very basic like food um, functionality that we have in Mathematica and Wolfram language. And then, um, and then we're going to go on to some sort of like uh, audience participation thing. So I think that will be fun. Um, and feel free to interrupt with questions throughout. Um, but I'm going to try to go pretty quick here. So um, uh, we do have quite, I would say, thorough nutrition support for many, many foods in our database. Um, we have over 450,000 foods, um, over 150 nutrients. And um, these are all sort of like some really niche ones, some really common ones, stuff that you would want to know about food. So here we have omega-6 fatty acid content, omega-3 fatty acid. We also have like calorie information and stuff like that. Um, and here, this, this uh, formulation here, if you haven't seen it before, is kind of how you do a shorthand version of like entity value to get sort of the information out of these entities. Um, this right here is something that we call sort of like an explicit food. So this is a... Um, a specific instance of a food um, that you could like go to the store and buy. We also have a different implementation of food where you can sort of ask for the general idea of all crustaceans, uh, all raw northern lobster crustaceans that you could get and we'll give you sort of like an averaged value for um, for whatever nutrients that you're asking about. Um, so there's two different ways to use it. Um, let me move on. We also have this really cool nutrition label property, which will give you sort of like the common nutrition label that you're used to seeing on packaging. Um, so here we have uh, something that is, it might be a little small on the screen, so sorry about that, but um, you can resize it too, I'm pretty sure. Let me just do that. Yeah, so um, this is sort of like up to the like recommended daily value stuff that we have from the FDA. And um, we're also in, like including the nutrients that are uh, recommended by them as well. So this is kind of a standard thing. Um, I think it's pretty cool, um, but it uses all the same information that our other properties will use as well. Um, we also, one of the ways that we do this with implicit foods, like I was saying before, is um, when we ask for like the general sort of um, version of a food, we have all of our single instances of foods tagged with so many different food attributes. Um, so if you wanted to do, for example, a search of all the apples, we can give you that. We can give you all the red delicious apples. Um, and those you can get um, by going to this property categorical property values, but you can also just get it from like natural language inputs. Um, but here we can see sort of an example of how we might tag up a food and all the different types of things that we can tell you about a certain food. So right here we have this apples raw, red, delicious, um, and we have, we can give you the food type of it, which is usually sort of like the, the most base thing that you can ask for. Um, and then we have a bunch of other attributes as well, like peeling type preparation. For this one, we have some brand name information, um, sugar label, flavor. So there's sort of um, 60, here I put 60, I, I think it's probably more at this point, categories that you can um, use to sort of build your, um, search query in a sense of what types of foods you want included in the average out value that you that we give you. Um, okay. Um, and it's kind of a really, really huge system. So um, this is just a really cool graphic that shows you sort of how complex the network of the data types that we have in our food database is. And if you want to go to this QR code, um, it'll take you to a website that will show you sort of like the legend for this graphic and um, give you kind of an idea of all the different types of information that we have about food um, in our database. So I highly recommend going to that. It's, it's really cool. And I think um, it gives you kind of a, an idea of the like breadth of everything that we have um, and all the complicated things that we have going on in food. 
Um, like I said, you can get to it via natural language processing. So you can use this uh, really cool function interpreter. We have a food interpreter. You can also get to food using more general interpreters as well. Um, but these are the types of things that we can understand. And then this also looks pretty small. I don't think I can resize that, but this is what I was talking about with the implicit food type thing. So here we're gonna be giving you sort of an averaged out nutrition and properties for all the red delicious apples that we have in our database, which I think makes it sort of more robust and easier to work with. Um, we've recently done a big push on trying to get our branded foods like up to date and our fast foods. So we also have that. Um, and I think that is really cool because I think these um, constructs are, are really useful, but I think sometimes it's hard to get working with them when you don't really know what they are or you're not familiar. So natural language, I would say, is the, the place to start for anyone trying to get into this um, food functionality that we have. Um, yeah, so we can also work directly with these attributes that I was talking before. Um, so here we are working directly with food types. You can we have a food type interpreter. I think this might be the only food attribute um, other than just food in general that we actually have an interpreter for, um, but you can get to these via um, some natural language processing as well. You can also run sort of like in a, a general entity value call to get all the food type entities that we have and see what we see what kind of stuff that we have in there. We have, I would say, almost 2000 food types. Um, so we have, I think, a pretty good coverage of <laughs> all the different types of foods that you could want. Um, and definitely file a complaint if we don't. <laughs> We're always trying to add new stuff. Um, and like I said, we are always trying to add new stuff. In um, previous uh, tech conference talks, we've had sort of like a graphic that shows you how many foods we have in our database. Now we have um, like very close to 500,000 foods in our database, which I think is, is wild. Um, but we started with sort of like this tiny amount. So we're constantly adding stuff. We get um, a huge amount of our foods from the USDA database. So um, they update it sort of bi-yearly. And so we try to keep up to date with that as well. So if you um, if there's like a new packaged food or something out, um, we, we will do our best to get that in as well. And we're just growing and growing and growing. So I think, like I said before, the more data that we have sort of like the more robust our averaging will be and the more um, data points that we have to work from. So um, I have this cool um, 3D graph that I made based on many different data points for um, many different foods. So we have, like I said, these implicit foods, which sort of hold the abstract idea of what a food is. So like red delicious apples as a whole. Um, and within that, we have many, many entities. So like, I think for that, that food, we may have uh, just a handful of entities that are red delicious apples. Um, but if you would like to, you can also go find those individual data points and bypass sort of like the automatic averaging that we do and, and look at some cool information on that. So here we have a graph with um, the three axes are like fat, carbs, and protein content for each of these foods. Um, and right now this kind of looks, I think a little bit interesting. We have like some clustering so we can tell like some foods have similar profiles in terms of looking at these nutrition, um, these nutritional contents. And then here I have another version of that same exact graph with some colors that sort of tell you what the food type is, which I thought was pretty interesting. So um, we can see that like our peanut butter and our almonds, which are those like blue and green dots over here, um, kind of cluster together, which I thought was really cool because, you know, almonds, nuts, and then peanut butter is made from nuts as well. Um, and so we have all this, this cool stuff that you can do with all these sort of individual data points that we have um, in addition to our sort of more general type of querying as well. So um, we've also been adding new properties so um, and new data all the time. So uh, previously, we kind of had a gap where we didn't really have a lot of specific alcoholic beverages in our database. And so if people were trying to type in sort of like what they had in a day, they were like, oh, my glass of wine in the evening. And we, we weren't able to understand that. So we added a whole bunch of um, alcoholic beverages data. And um, here's just sort of like a sampling of what types of food types we have that live inside of this um, umbrella of alcoholic beverages. Um, and we have lots of really good information about that stuff. Um, one of the attributes that I was talking about before that we do have for these is location, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so you can sort of see like where in the world do we have like 
these whiskeys being produced um, that we have in our database. So a lot of these are going to be like branded whiskeys, obviously. So it's like the whiskey that you can go buy at the store. Um, and they'll, they'll include sort of where it's made and where it's from, which I thought was pretty interesting. Another new property that we have is um, these cold storage time recommendations. So the USDA has recommendations on um, sort of like what, uh, how, how long a food will be good in the fridge or in the freezer. And so we have implemented this in our food. So you can sort of ask like, how long can I keep my um, raw sausage in the freezer or fridge? And then this is tiny, sorry about that, but it, it'll give you sort of like that information as well, um, which I think is pretty cool. And so um, I'm gonna hand over the talk to one of my team members and we're gonna have a little audience participation and we're gonna see if um, our sort of common sense matches up with what our recommendations are for food safety and whether or not I should eat something that I had in the fridge for a certain amount of time. So here's Gay Wilson. Good morning, good morning. Um, as the registered dietitian on the food team, I'm actually very excited about us bringing these, uh, bringing food safety properties to the Wolfram community uh, for education uh, and for all sorts of, for analysis and for all sorts of purposes. As Isabel mentioned, these are USDA. Uh, this is USDA uh, reliable data uh, that we've incorporated. So we thought we're not gonna embarrass anybody. We're not gonna bring anybody up. <laughs> we're gonna do show of hands. Uh, so we're going to uh, kind of let's, let's check our knowledge about uh, freezer and refrigerator uh, storage of certain foods, and then let's check the answer in the Wolfram language. <laughs> well, let me, I actually, that's a very good point. Let me kind of clarify that. The USDA recommendations, granted, many of them are based on safety, bacterial growth, and so forth. And then some of the USDA recommendations are based on food quality. So some of this is just food quality after a certain amount of time in your freezer. Is that salmon in your freezer a year from now? It, 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 would, it may be safe to eat, but is it really going to be a great dinner, you know? So, you know, so it, it, some of these are, are actually uh, uh, maintaining the quality uh, and integrity of the food uh, versus the food safety. So I, I agree. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see the answers coming now. So we're going to start with this one first. Okay, it's Monday lunchtime, and I have leftover pizza in the fridge from Friday night. Here's our question. Should I eat that? Okay, let's see. A show of hands for yes. Should I eat that for lunch? <laughs> just, just satisfaction of that. Uh, what about who says no? Don't eat that pizza from Friday. All right, let's see the answer. <laughs> oh, I didn't even not even think of that category. I should have thought of that. All right, so we've got we're about split. So. Uh, so the storage per the USDA for that pizza is three to four days. So if you got it Friday night, it's Monday lunchtime, you're okay to have that pizza for lunch. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's gonna be okay. Now, this is an assumption that you got it into your fridge in a certain amount of time Friday night. You didn't leave it overnight on the counter and then put it in the fridge, right? So, all right, let's go, we, we're, let's move on. I bought ground beef Tuesday for a family cookout Saturday. Can I keep the raw ground beef in the refrigerator until then? Tuesday to Saturday. Who says it's okay to keep it in the fridge and then grill it Saturday? Who says it's okay? Okay, who says, okay, who says no? No, I wouldn't. All right, all right. So we're, again, we're about split. Let's see what, what does Wolfram, uh, Wolfram language say? One to two days, you really should, in this case, it really was best to go ahead and freeze that ground beef on Tuesday when you brought it home and then put it in the fridge, say Friday night, and let that, you know, thaw in the fridge and then grill that on Saturday. One to two days, I have accidentally forgotten some ground beef in my fridge. And a few days later, yeah, I wasn't keen to grill it at that point. <laughs> very, very conservatively, probably. It's the USDA. So there, so I think it's kind of, you're on your own after that, right? You know, <laughs> probably, but yeah, that's, these are fairly conservative. I think, you know, when I, we were pulling the data cause we did want to point to reliable data source. So we, that's why we chose the USDA 
and our and actually there are probably some other with other uh uh bodies you know uh, who have different times oh, and our food our, new, our own food lab was an awesome idea i love that <laughs> All right, let's go. And we got a couple more. I love grilled salmon with dill sauce. It's my personal favorite. How long can I keep raw salmon in my freezer? Uh, and is let's see a show of hands for two to three months. All right, let's see a show of hands to six to eight months. Okay, let's see what Wolfram Language says. Two to three months now. In a way, the other the, you, those of you who said six to eight months, you were right for those other fish, lower fat fish, because what's the difference between salmon and mackerel and say haddock and cod, omega-3 fatty acids, right? So this, again, this is a case of probably where it's not necessarily a food safety, it's probably the food quality uh, because those omega-3 fatty acids in the salmons the, uh, and the mackerels, uh, the recommended time is much shorter, two to three months in your freezer to keep that quality. Uh, whereas if you have that haddock or cod or a lower fat fish, that's the six to eight month time frame. If you ask Wolfram language for haddock, it's going to tell you six to eight months. So, all right, one more. I bought a fresh butternut squash at the farmer's market, but I only need half of it for my recipe. How long can I store the rest in the refrigerator? Who says four to five days? How many four to five days? All right. How many eight to 10 days do we have? What does the Wolfram language tell us? Four to five days. Again, that's a it's a it depends on your squash, right? <laughs> depends on and a lot of factors there. But this is the general recommendation uh, of four to five days for quality of that of that butternut squash for your for your next recipe. Oh, I think that's my that this is assumed a cut a cut squash. Yeah. Yeah. In fact. Yeah, in fact, uh, um, uh, in, in fact, they, the, US, the F, USDA does make a distinction on whole, intact uh, uh, of, of be, uh, vegetables and fruits versus the cut. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did. You guys did great. You guys did great, and we've got this for about two hundred foods. Uh, we have we do have the freezer frozen uh, storage uh, property. We're very excited about bringing food science and food safety because that's what food is, right? Food is science, uh, and so we're very excited about um, that that direction. So do check out check out our new uh, uh, storage properties. Yeah, I also wanted to point out too, like these are just sort of a, a testing of like a little taster, I guess, of the. Um, the new stuff that we have and we're always trying to add new cool stuff that we think will be useful for people so if anyone wants to come up to me and has suggestions or things that they would actually use i would love to hear that um, because we're always sort of looking for new stuff to add um, and wanting to make it really useful for for everybody um, i think we have time for questions um so we right now um we kind of are are sort of angling for sort of like the average user because i think um at least in my opinion, um, a lot of the stuff that you can do with Mathematica and Wolfram Office is somewhat advanced. Like I know there's a lot of stuff for like high school kids learning and, and college kids learning and stuff like that. And I think that that's, that's really great too. But um, I think sort of like stuff that is useful to the everyday person, I think food is something that is a really great opportunity for that. So that's what we've kind of tried to do for now. But um, like as in earlier in my talk, I don't know about industrial applications, but you can get some kind of cool like nut nutrition distribution and stuff like that with five hundred thousand data points um there's a lot that you can analyze there's a lot that you can look at um and i think that's that's really interesting too um but i do i do see what you're saying like if if there's sort of more of an industrial application we we haven't really thought of it yet but Totally. Yeah. So, um, so I think um, in terms of like a scientific lens, like what you're mentioning here is, is ingredient substitution, for example, for recipes um, from a science lens, we don't necessarily look at it, but we do have sort of recommendations and we actually have a property that holds that information too. So if you wanted to go in and say like, uh, what do I use instead of butter? Uh, we have some information on that too. Um, and then in terms of recipes, I think that's a really interesting um, uh like path to go down for this as well, because we do have really good natural language processing for this type of stuff. So I think at the end of the day, one of our um, sort of reach goals is to be able to take a recipe and sort of ingest it and sort of make sort of these entity 
type um, representations of each of the ingredients um, and be able to sort of calculate, I don't know, nutrition for a dish or something like that based on that. So I think that's something that we're super interested in doing. And I think that we have the tools for it here. Um, and I would love to see also uh, like the users actually try and use it for that um, because I've definitely tried it out. It's pretty fun. And I think um, there's a lot that you can sort of tease this data into that, it, that could be useful for a lot of different applications. Yeah, I think I think in general we try to um, stay away from giving like recommendations to individuals because I think we don't necessarily have all the information. Um, there are certain things that you could use our data to calculate. If you were like watching your sodium intake or something like that, you could say like in general, is this a high sodium food? You could look at that, but we're not going to be telling you like eat tomatoes to resist cancer or eat this to get this effect. Um, I think that's something a little bit beyond what we're able to do. Um, we also don't have um, necessarily the authority to be telling people that. So I think that's the kind of thing that um, we're not really interested in touching on. Um, but we do, I mean, we, we are trying to keep up to date with like the most recent like data that we can give you. So we would maybe say, like, we'd be able to tell you, like you said, tomatoes are high in phosphorus. We would be able to eventually tell you like, what is the con contents of the tomato? But we wouldn't say like, you should eat this or not. Thank you guys so much.